Thanks so much for coming. I'm Eric Dyer. I'm ar architect and board member of AIA Monterey Bay. Thank you for coming to our first presentation of AIA Monterey Bay's 2023 Arts and Architecture Lecture Series, Housing, Finding Solutions with Architecture. Um, I wanted to be proper and I did see a few public officials, the city council people from Carmel by the Sea, Karen Felito and Bobby Richards. <laughs> city Administrator, Vipika. Norgard, Martin, <laughs> in the back. I'd like to thank Sandbox, Sand City, where you're sitting, and the people behind it, Michelle Jokic, who can't be here tonight, and her husband, Mark. Uh, you really need to check out sandboxsandcity.com to see some of their amazing music, musical and arts-based programs coming up. They really put on some very spectacular presentations here, and we're, we're really lucky to be able to take advantage of it. I'd like to also thank the AIA Monterey Bay's Board of Directors and the members of the Arts and Architecture Me Committee, as well as our Executive Director, Shermaine Jones. Thank you, Shermaine. Um, without their hard work, making this community outreach would not be possible. Another thank you uh, to the sponsors of this series. And tonight, I want to recognize Silcon Constructors and Silveria, Silveri Properties. Um, they're building a lot of housing around the Central Coast and the Bay Area. And I'm happy to see Dan. I think I saw you there. Dan Saveri is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe, uh, Justin, you could let me know this, but I also want to, an opportunity to thank Midpin Housing for sponsoring our next lecture on March 16th. And I'm not sure if any of the members for Midpin are here, but I want to, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, as we all know, housing is such a critical issue in our area and throughout California. It's being discussed, debated, and legislated in the halls of Sacramento and virtually every jurisdiction in our state. We thought it was important to present this series uh, to bring the community together to encourage the one solution to the housing crisis we know, and that is to get more housing built. Tonight, we start with a talk that will give some context to why we have this housing crisis and why it's so acute in California, but also what is being done at the state level and different localities to address it. In our next two lectures, we will look at real solutions with architecture by bringing in two of the leading architecture firms in California and the nation who are getting well-designed, thoughtful, sustainable housing built. Solutions which really make a difference in our communities, towns, and cities and certainly for the people who live in them. Solutions which address not only constructing more housing units, but creating denser, more sustainable cities based on solid principles of urban design. Showing how architectural design excellence does matter. And certainly when you compare it to, to what was going on in the 1960s and 70s, where there was clear, which clearly lacked a lot of those projects, clearly lacked a lot of those good qualities and ghettoized people at lower income levels into what was called projects. Lessons have been learned and should not be forgotten. On March 16th, we have Daniel Simons, FAIA, and Pedro Farish Bondi, AIA, principals of David Baker Architects, uh, perhaps a leading housing firm in San Francisco in the Bay Area, which has been doing great work for over 40 years. They'll be presenting concepts, concepts in their new book, Nine Ways to Make Housing for People. On April 27th, we are really honored to be bringing in Larry Scarpa, FAIA, and Angie Brooks, FAIA, of Brooks Scarpa, primarily based in Los Angeles. And last year, Angie and Larry won the highest design award in the country, the AIA National Gold Medal. This will be a really inspiring presentation, so I hope we see you all there. And they'll be presenting their concepts on density in cities and housing design for market rate and affordable uh, projects. Finally, on May 18th, here at Sandbox, we'll have a community forum and panel discussion bringing together public officials, who are some are here today, planners, who are some are here today, and hopefully we'll be there at this meeting, uh, housing advocates and developers to really get into ways we can move forward here on the Central Coast and start making real progress toward building more housing here in the right places, at the right scale, for all income levels. So please go online to our website and register for all these now. But now I'd want to inter introduce our tonight's speaker, Liam Dillon. Liam covers housing affordability and neighborhood change across California for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, 
prior to the housing beat, Liam covered state politics and policy at the time, Sacramento Bureau. He, along with Manuela Tobias, host an excellent podcast examining housing in California called Gimme Shelter, which comes out weekly. And you should definitely check that out if you haven't already to stay current on all these issues. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and grew up outside Philadelphia. So we know what he'll be doing on Sunday <laughs> <laughs> and who he'll be rooting for. <laughs> anyway, Liam Dillon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Eric, it is extremely easy to agree to say yes to talk in Monterey, so thank you. Um, so my presentation is why California housing ha has a housing crisis and how everyone is trying to fix it. Just a little more background about me. I've been covering California housing issues for, uh, I guess, close to seven, exactly seven years now. I'm at my seventh anniversary at the LA Times this month. Um, I started in our Sacramento State Capitol Bureau covering a lot of the legislation, policy, and that happened to align with a lot of new activity on housing issues that started around 2016, 2017. And then since late 2019, I've been based in LA. My original plan was to travel the state and write about all sorts of things that were happening. But of course, that was only a few months before we weren't allowed to leave our homes. Um, and so uh, now uh, I've been getting to starting to travel more, but still writing about kind of housing affordability neighborhood change, but more from a neighborhood perspective, sort of bottom up rather than top down from what I was doing in Sacramento. Before that, I covered local government in San Diego. And so I've, you know, for many, many years now, close to cl over 10, um, kind of understood or looked around uh, many, many different uh, uh, ways that people are trying to address housing problems in the state. Okay, let's see. So the problem, um, it's funny, I always get, it's always more and more depressing when I have to update this slide, um, but the <laughs> state's median home value is more than twice the national average, and I, I included the local um, rental figures in the Salinas metro area that are Nearly uh, 500 more a month than the national average to rent here. Okay, so what does this problem mean? I mean, some pretty scary and bad stuff, right? I mean, people may think that the states with the highest poverty rate are states like Mississippi or Alabama, but that's not true. Um, and they do have some of the highest poverty rates when you look at the at traditional measure of poverty. But the census measure that includes cost of living, which of course housing is the most primary driver of that, 13.2% um, of, of people in California are in, um, yeah, 13.2% of people in California are in poverty, which is the highest in the nation. That's about 5 million people. Um, the uh, homeless population figure here is as of uh, January 2022. Do people know how the homeless count happens, like how we get the official figures? Okay, so it's not very scientific, but it's the most scientific we have. Basically, on one night of the year in January, all around the country, people, volunteers mostly, go out and count, literally count people, and that's how it's done. Um, and so, again, not super scientific. They will work with little iPads to, like, type, you know, to, to get um, and estimates based on if they see a trailer that appears, they'll estimate the number of folks who are living in there. Um, but Still, uh, the best sort of the best numbers we have, but because of that, it is almost certainly an undercount. You know, a lot of flaws in that. Um, but so, what I see the the population homeless population come out it comes out every January. Um, I usually use it as a barometer: are things going up or down, rather than like this is the actual number, right? Um, so, nevertheless, with those caveats out of the way, uh, California's homeless homeless population has gone up during the during the pandemic to now around 170,000 people across the state. So for comparison's sake, if the state's homeless population were a city, it would be the largest in Monterey County. Um, more than two thirds of uh, folks who are homeless in California are unsheltered. And that's very different than say um, New York, where there are 74,000 homeless people, uh, but, uh, but just 5% of the homeless population is unsheltered. And people may think, oh, California, the weather, et cetera, et cetera, but it's really not that. You know, there's, it really goes to show how much policy matters. Uh, in New York City, uh, for decades, there's been a law that requires a right to shelter. And as a result, um, that is the primary reason why the, the unsheltered homeless population in New York is, uh, is so low. Um, 
So this data uh, on uh, uh, this U.S. Census every few weeks puts out data on folks who are behind on their rent. So that's uh, that most recent number. And then there were just some uh, really interesting stats that the state legislative analyst uh, put out uh, just this week on uh, the extent of this problem. Um, Californians spend a larger share of their income on rent than uh, households in the rest of the nation at every single income quartile, right? So rich people, poor people, everybody's spending more of their income on rent than anywhere else in the country. Um, that is, there is about 2.5 million low-income households that are cost burdened in California. And what that means is you spend uh, more than 30% of your income on housing. That's the official definition of cost burden. And then uh, over 1.5 million low-income renters face even more dire prospects. They spend more than half of their income on housing. Okay. Next slide. So how did we get here? Does everyone know who this guy is? This is, this is the rent is too damn high guy who was really prescient in New York about 15 years ago, ran on a mayoral platform that was basically just the rent is too damn high, and you know, he was correct. So <laughs> how did we get here? So we don't build enough, first of all. Um, and this slide is really instructive because it shows that we used to sort of build enough, right? I mean, you look at the numbers in the, the 50s and the, the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, even some early 2000s, and we were building a lot of housing in California. And now, you know, we're not. Um, the black line in terms of how much we need to build to meet demand, that's the official estimate of the state housing uh, department, which for many years has said sort of meet uh, projected population growth and also taking into account kind of high housing costs and, and, and uh, sort of pent up demand in California. There needs to be built 180,000 units every single year. And, you know, we're now, the last few years, this, this chart's a little out of date, 2019, but we're basically cresting 100,000. Um, my guess is when um, the 2022 numbers will come in, they'll come in around 120, uh, which is, will have been the highest in a while, um, but still nowhere near um, the 180 that, that, um, that we need to build. And in fact, in the, in the last three decades, we've only eclipsed that 180,000 figure three times, just over three to 05. So even going back to the 90s, that's the extent to which we're talking about a housing shortage here. And then if you could see in the upper right, that's the picture of the governor there, uh, Gavin Newsom. O on the campaign trail, he pledged that uh, the state would build 500,000 units uh, every year during his time in office. Um, I wrote a story uh, t basically saying how ridiculous that was, and I've taken some joy into holding him to account over the past few years uh, because they've come nowhere near uh, nowhere near that number. Okay, next slide. So we also don't fund affordable housing. You know, um, just some stats for this. Um, you know, the Legislative Analyst Office, which is a great source of, for data like this, did sort of a thought experiment a few years ago, examining what it would cost to build uh, new housing just for low-income renter families who are severely cost burdened. Remember, that's those who spend more than 50% of their income on rent. And they said, okay, let's do a bond measure. If we were to do a bond measure to do it statewide, what would it be? And they estimated that it would cost between 15 to 30 billion a year for the next 30 years just to provide uh, subsidized housing for folks at the most, with the most dire need. I think it's also important to, you know, people think of subsidized housing, they think of it as for renters, right? But I think we really need to understand that we give a tremendous amount of subsidy to homeowners. Um, and in, you know, the mortgage interest reduction, uh, both in California and statewide, is you know, a higher number than what renters get through Section 8 vouchers or things of that nature. And so that's I think, is, again, really important to keep in mind when we talk about subsidized housing. Subsidized for who, right? And at the end of the day, um, homeowners do get more tax breaks than renters do. OK, next slide. So, for many, many reasons, this is not the government's fault, right? You have uh, material prices. There was, during the pandemic, there was all this uh, talk about how lumber prices, like the graph was going through the roof, right? Um, labor prices, the government doesn't control that. Uh, certainly, the state and local governments don't control interest rates. Uh, demographics, you know, there's a huge band of uh, millennials right now, the millennial generation, entering prime family formation age, which, you know, would in, uh, uh, imply that they would need more homes or bigger homes, right? Um, land in California is increasingly sparse. Um, you know, when jobs come to town, that means more, you need more housing. That's generally a good thing when you have jobs, right? 
Um, you know, uh, real estate speculation as well uh, is increasing in the extent that there are now some new suburban subdivisions that are being built that are entirely for rent. So it used to be these are all for, you know, uh, the home ownership opportunities, and now they're, um, now they're for rent. Okay. Next slide. So, but actually, yeah, in many, many ways, it is the government's fault. Um, you know, this is a story that a colleague and I did in uh, last summer, and it follows up on a story that we did a couple years prior. We took a, a deep dive into why it costs so much to build low-income housing in California. And, you know, we've now found um, 11 projects in the state that are more than $1 million per unit to build. They're all, these are all in Northern California. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all those things I was saying before about lumber and, you know, material prices and interest rates, of course all those things matter. But there are, my point here is there are a tremendous amount of things within the control of the government that, uh, that makes uh, uh, housing really, really, really expensive to build. And, of course, if it's this expensive to build, that means the more money you have, the fewer units you get. Um, so, um, a couple of the things that, that are, you know, the government's fault. Um, there's a lot of layering of financing, and certainly the affordable housing developers know how that process works. Um, you know, you have to get money from the state, but there are different agencies at the state. So, you apply to different agencies. Some of them are controlled by the governor. Some of them are controlled by other uh, elected officials. Then you want to try to get money. Maybe there's a local bond measure. You have to get that money. Um, so it's just let that, that process of layering the financing uh, costs a lot of money because you need to have consultants like examine all, you make sure you're meeting the requirements for that. It takes a lot of time. Um, other things like parking requirements, you know, if you build a space for a car, uh, that means less space for a person, right? Um, and so that's another thing that uh, adds to the cost to build, um, particularly in denser areas if there are large parking requirements, that requires parking garages. Then you've got to dig in the ground, and that's also very expensive. Uh, there are environmental requirements. You know, in many cases, um, some of the environmental requirements um, for low-income housing to be competitive to get some of these grants and tax credits um, are actually exceed you know, your solar power, your EV chargers, things like that, which we can all you know, agree are good things. But the cost of that and the requirements actually in many ways exceed what the requirements are for luxury condominiums. So we're building in these projects in many ways to higher standard, uh, environmental standard than we are market rate housing. And then there's also, um, you know, oftentimes union, union labor requirements, which again, a lot of these things you can argue in the abstract are great, right? We want construction workers to get paid. You know, we want to have the highest level of environmental standards for our buildings. Um, but when you put all of these things together, then that's what leads to these sort of giant costs. The one to me that I think is kind of the least defensible is um, the way that we hand out low-income housing dollars or affordable housing dollars. Most large states have just one agency that does it, right? California has five separate agencies with different requirements for what gets funded. And those agencies, as I said, report to different elected officials, and that leaves no one in charge of the system as a whole, right? And that's a big problem. You know, a 2018 study from the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that 14% of the price tag of California's affordable housing projects was made up of consulting fees and other administrative costs, okay? That's the highest in the country and more than what developers spend on land. So think about that. So to me, again, that's the least defensible of this process. Okay, next slide. So... Does more housing mean cheaper housing? I'd like to ask this question to everybody. The first one, who thinks building more housing makes housing less expensive? Show of hands. Okay. And everyone else either shy or they disagree. Okay. So the second one, um, how about within an individual neighborhood, building more housing in an individual neighborhood, especially one that's gentrifying, does that make housing more expensive or less expensive there? Let's say um, more expensive. Who thinks that? Okay, so this is like the primary debate, like literally every day on Twitter, every time I do a talk, every time I talk to anybody, these are the questions that people ask, right? So uh, I decided to ask, next one, um, LA's new mayor about this on my podcast, uh, Give Me Shelter, and so I was with a colleague, uh, a fill-in host, um, Ben Oreskes, um, so he and I talked to 
uh, new LA mayor, Karen Bass, uh, asking her this question. Um, and at the, just to con some more context for this, so this is what, at the end of our interview, and we gave her a series of statements where she could respond true or false and then explain her position. We like that kind of setup because it gets people to say right to the point, right? So we have the audio, I think, ready to go? Yeah, so I'll, I'll play the, uh, what Mayor Bass said. All right, let me get jump to the next one. Uh, the construction of market rate homes in disadvantaged areas does not cause gentrification or displacement, but instead prevents it. That's false. That's completely false. I'm sorry. <laughs> Say more about that. Well, I mean, the area that I lived in until a few weeks ago <laughs> in South LA, there's no question market rate housing um, people who paid $150,000 for their home, if you put a market rate house next door, it's going to be close to a million dollars. So, um, so ex explain a little more about how you believe that that drives that gentrification and drives displacement. Well, because, you know, the people that live in the neighborhood just say you want to move. You want to move to another house in the same neighborhood. You can't afford it if it's, if it's, if it's market rate. The other thing that happens is, is that, you know, you have people selling their homes. And I, I understand that. I mean, the house I lived in, I got offers all the time. Cash. We'll give you cash money for your house. So I watched the, the elders in my neighborhood sell their homes. But then their kids couldn't come back to the neighborhood at all. Mm -hmm. But how do I tell them not to walk away with over a million dollars? You know what I mean? Right. So who agrees with Mayor Bass's perspective? Decent amount of folks. OK. So um, let's go to the next slide. I want to give a little bit context in terms of what academic research says about these very questions, right? And there was actually a recent article in, uh, by a Bloomberg columnist named Justin Fox, who um, listened to our interview and uh, sort of runs down at, at uh, this sort of issue. Uh, these, and at the end of the article, so I recommend looking this up, lists all of the studies, kind of the major studies that were done, both on housing production and what it means at a regional level, and also what it means in a particular neighborhood. So I recommend that article, Justin Fox um, in Bloomberg. But I'll run down this. So, there's broad agreement that more home building in a region makes housing more affordable and that there's less displacement. And one article is um, this one I reference here is uh, written uh, by some folks at NYU's Furman Center in New York. But there's less agreement on what happens with specific prices and displacement when new market rate housing in a specific low income neighborhoods. So does that distinction make sense, right? At a regional level, the research says, more home building, whether it's affordable or market rate, means ameliorates um, housing costs and means there's less displacement. But in a particular neighborhood, right, partic one that's at risk of gentrifying or one where there's displacement already happening, you build new market rate there, and there's less agreement on what happens in the research. Some say yes, some say no with prices and displacement. So um, certainly, though, uh, we do know that when communities do things to limit development, that means that there's less development. And you know, many, many coastal communities in California um, have adopted measures, population caps, caps on development itself, you know, sort of severe building height limits that are aimed at limiting development. And then a, re a relatively recent study of these um, found that every growth control policy raises housing costs by much as 5% there. So again, another example we talked about how in New York, with respect to their right to shelter law, that policy had a big impact. These policies have a big impact as well. All right, next slide. So um, one thing California is great at is horrible acronyms. Um, so this is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment I'm going to talk about next. And it's pronounced RENA. Um, I think this is perhaps worse than CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. There's also Vehicle Miles Traveled, or VMT. The agency that regulates VMT is CARB, the California Air Resources Board. Uh, we could keep going. Um, every 
agent, every region has to produce an SCS to ensure to tell CARB that their VMT is decreasing. So anyway, I can keep going, but for the sake of all this, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop. But it's important, I think, for the context for this conversation about uh, the regional housing needs assessment. This was a piece I did a number of years ago examining that even though we've had this process in place uh, since um, the late 1960s, it, it obviously we have a severe housing crisis here. So let me explain what this is. Every eight years, every community in the state has to set aside sufficient land for housing based on a number that the state housing department puts out as far as um, how much housing you need at all income levels, various income levels, to meet, again, projected population growth and um, uh, other factors, other demographic factors. So this process has never worked, truly never worked. And some of it is kind of, you know, um, pretty lame, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, cities for years, they would do things like, uh, have to give a list of sites to the state, say, hey, this is a potential site where more houses can get built. They would do things like, oh, this median strip here? Yeah, there'll be 200 units of housing, <laughs> right? Um, they would, I you know, led my story here with a, a, with a, a quote, um, a conversation at a city council meeting in Foster City in the Bay Area, where the city council member says, says in the meeting, yeah, 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 we'll approve this plan, but let's be honest, this is a shell game. We're, ever, we're never actually going to approve the housing that we say that we're planning for. Right? And so this process um, has been you know, fraught with these things for a very long time. Some, uh, some things were actually turned out to be really gross about this. Um, I went back through the archives again for this story to try to find cities that got to try to get, were trying to get out of these arena requirements. And they got state lawmakers to introduce bills. None of these passed, um, but I think it just sort of goes to show some of the hatred from local governments to, to, to this process. Um, introduced bills to let student housing count as low-income housing, uh, maids quarters to count as low-income housing, and then most egregiously, um, the city of Folsom about uh, 15 years ago had a bill introduced by their legislature that uh, attempted to count prison beds as low-income housing. <laughs> so, um, next slide. Okay, so there have been some changes in this, in this, uh, in this process, you know, recently. Um, you know, um, a number of bills um, increased these uh, arena targets, right, and then made it harder for cities to say no to new development. Um, this story that I wrote in 2018 was about legislation known as SB 828, which is the one that sort of really increased what the housing targets were, and I'll show you what that means for Monterey in a, in a moment. Um, there's also another uh, a bill uh, called SB 330 that, again, made it harder for projects to be denied. And next slide. Um, oops, not quite. Uh, go back. Yeah. So there definitely has been a shift in state legislative thinking um, in recent years, um, driven in part by the governor, um, there are now sort of more penalties for not meeting renewal goals. Um, cities with low housing production have to give streamlined and uh, no secret review to projects that set aside a certain percentage uh, for low-income families, and that's SB 35, another piece of legislation that you may have heard of. Um, but anyway, let's keep going here. So um, next slide. So what does this mean, these sort of new targets mean for Monterey? So on the left, uh, Monterey is currently now in the process of planning for this eight-year cycle, right? On the left was um, what the numbers were by income level for the previous cycle, the one that's just ending now. And you can see it's kind of hard in terms of how these tables are set up, but on the upper left, um, uh, upper left, um, the AMBAG region, that's the region that we're in, uh, 10,000 new homes need to be planned, planned for in the previous eight-year cycle. You can see now upper right corner, the current cycle, three times that, 33,000, or 33,000, right? Um, and that's just sort of by community what and by income level what the planning process needs to be. Um, the deadline for um, uh, uh, Monterey cities to get their housing plans approved by the state is this December 15th. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So, What's happening now? Are there, I mentioned that, you know, there may be some more consequences or teeth 
um, to not following this law as there had not been in the past. Um, and this guy uh, is a developer, and he certainly looks like one. Um, but he's, he's a story, uh, he's a character in a story that I wrote uh, just this past fall in Santa Monica, uh, which is sort of the, new, the hot new uh, consequence that's being talked about a lot. Um, it's called the builder's remedy. And this has never before been used, but it's been in state law since 1990. And it says essentially that um, in cities that do not have state approved housing plans, so remember, you have to get, can we go back just quickly? Um, every community, right, in the state has to ultimately get their housing plan approved by the state. For Monterey, it's December 15th. Okay, go, go forward again. So for communities that do not have state housing plans approved, um, and of which there are many now, um, this is the consequence that may come up. Developers essentially um, can propose up anything they want um, in a community that does not have a state approved housing plan, provided that, and the city council, uh, elected officials have almost no means to say no to that, provided that the project has at least 20% uh, low income housing or 100% moderate income housing. So this developer in Santa Monica was a, um, has a bit of a trailblazer in using this builder's remedy um, because he has proposed, among the developers, but the, most of the projects are his, have proposed uh, 4,500 new units in Santa Monica, which under this mechanism, which would be more housing than has been built in Santa Monica in over a decade, right? Um, one project, is a 15-story high-rise, uh, which would be the largest uh, building in Santa Monica outside of their downtown. And so all under this plan, where the city council, um, uh, in, in many ways, is really powerless, potentially, to stop it. Um, there are other projects, uh, other cities, rather. Uh, Redondo Beach, there's a big project being proposed on a power plant site, uh, 2,200 units under this builder's remedy plan. Um, there's one, there's a project in Beverly Hills, there's a project in a, on a, proposed on a golf course in La Habra in Orange County, all using this process. So will it actually happen? Um, again, the law says there's not many ways for cities to say no, but there are other laws. You know, many big projects, especially one including the 15-story uh, 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 apartment complex that this gentleman is proposing to build in Santa Monica, would have to go through the California Environmental Quality Act, right? So while the city council may not be able to say no under the builder's remedy law. There are other laws like CEQA that could sort of stymie the projects. But again, I think it's important to note how, you know, sort of how expansive this could be. Uh, more than half of the cities in Southern California, which had their housing plan deadline earlier, so last fall, more than half the cities are now out of compliance. Um, so this, in theory, could apply there. Um, and the Bay Area just had their housing plan deadline on January 31st, and there are about 100 cities now that are not compliant. I think only four, it was my, at last count, um, are actually have state compliant housing plans at this, at this moment. So, um, next slide. Okay, so what is working, right? I think it's important that we discuss that. Um, there definitely is, I, you know, I showed, we, can, I don't, we don't need to go back, but if you recall, the top slide, one of the top slides, was about housing production in the state and how it really has not um, increased very much, except there is one area where housing production really is going gangbusters. And that is, um, that is I'm going to take a deep breath here to describe what these uh, homes are called. Backyard homes, backyard cottages, accessory dwelling unit, additional dwelling unit, ADU, granny flat, in-law unit, secondary unit, garage conversion, and my favorite version of the term, casita, okay? So there definitely has been, whatever you want to call it, a huge boom statewide in this kind of housing production. Starting in 2016, the state made it a lot, lot easier for these to get built really all over the state. A whole bunch of laws that were passed, restricting sort of city rules to charge, you know, very high water and sewage fees to connect, right? Um, Lot, laws about lot size, very technical laws about lot sizes, setbacks, et cetera. But the result, again, has sort of been really remarkable. Um, statewide, about 60,000 of them have been built since 2016. Um, in LA, in 2021, 
uh, just over 5,000 of these casitas were permitted. That's compared to 60, 60 in 2016 before all these laws came into effect. So one out of four homes built in LA in 2021 was an ADU, was a casita, which is a, a dramatic change, a dramatic difference. Um, some of them are very pretty, you know, like this one in LA that is here. Um, the advantage of these, of course, is that it builds an already established neighborhood, so you're adding density there. Um, individual homeowners can do it. You don't need to be like a giant developer to be able to build this um, in your uh, uh, backyard. So not a huge barrier to entry, sort of comparatively speaking, as there might be if you wanted to be a developer of four plexes or of, you know, eight plexes or multi-story buildings, right? Um, next slide. So what is working in a bit more of a question mark here? Um, so the money faucet on the right, you know? Um, recent years, the state has poured a tremendous amount more money into housing and homelessness than ever before. Uh, one thing that I think has been particularly successful, the governor inaugurated a program that's called Project Home Key, where uh, started during the pandemic using federal dollars, where the state buys up underutilized hotels and motels and turns them into homeless housing, permanent homeless housing. And that's been a big su success so far in terms of getting housing quickly and more affordably than, say, the $1 million per unit projects that I was uh, showing earlier. Um, but, you know, for, for the last few years, we've had really high state budget and a lot of money going towards housing because of uh, federal pandemic relief and also because the stock market was doing great and the state relies on high income earners to basically fund the lion's share of its budget. Stock market did not have a good year last year. There's a budget deficit now. And so um, unclear what, if anything, will be cut in the budget. But it is clear the money faucet's being turned off, slowly but surely. And then you, know, you might wonder why I have a mountain lion here. Um, but uh, the Attorney General, you know, as I mentioned before, there are uh, some um, sort of new evidence that elected officials like the governor and the Attorney General are sort of cracking down on people who are doing sorts of things like saying they're going to build housing and meeting strips, right? So probably the most hilarious example of this, um, there was a new law that was passed a couple of years ago called SB9, which allows for these basically end, effectively ended single family home only zoning in California. Said you could build duplexes or fourplexes on pretty much any parcel of land. Um, but there are some exceptions and uh, written into the law. And the community of Woodside in the Silicon Valley decided that, because one of the exceptions was um, for endangered species, decided to declare their entire community a mountain lion habitat uh, in a very transparent attempt to avoid allowing SB9 or duplexes in their community. Um, one sort of widespread scorn uh, uh, happened at this, again, transparent um, uh, effort. The Attorney General stepped in. Uh, Rob Bonten said, no, nah, you can't do that. That's against, that's against the law, and Woodside ultimately backed down. And so there's some more examples of things like elected officials saying, no, no, state officials saying, no, 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 you can't do things like, you know, say you're a mountain lion community and, and, and can't allow for housing as a result. Additionally, um, the state recently gave seven cities what they call, are calling a pro-housing designation, which allows them to have access to sort of more state affordable housing money. Uh, most of them are in the Sacramento area. Um, so they've done things like um, pre-approved ADU plans. You can walk in and just get a permit rather than having to you know, go through the back and forth process. Uh, reducing fees developers will pay. Uh, doing a big CEQA review um, over, do people know what that is or should I explain CEQA a little? No, no, okay. So California Environmental Quality Act is a law that was passed, um, many people like to um, note, uh, signed by Ronald Reagan during his tenure as governor, right? And it essentially, in many ways, just requires disclosure of what an environmental, project's environmental effects are, and then requires people to try to mitigate them to the greatest extent possible. So it's predominantly just a disclosure law. But there are many, 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 many things about what you have to disclose that make it very, very hard and time consuming for people to follow. And so it, and if you happen to lose a lawsuit under CEQA as a developer, that can often, oftentimes bring you back to square one. So you'll have to produce these you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 page environmental reviews. And if you lose a lawsuit saying you didn't disclose a particular impact in a certain way, then oftentimes you start getting at square one. 
And so there are many folks who will argue that the law helped, has helped preserve the natural beauty of California, of course. But there's equal number of folks who will argue, well, that may be true to a certain extent, but also it can be used to you know, stymie projects for reasons that don't really have much to do with um, environmental law uh, in particular. Um, you know, I've written about how neighborhood groups would use CEQA to try to stop uh, homeless housing development. Um, uh, labor, frankly, construction worker unions are particularly uh, good, if you will, at using this law to sort of leverage uh, uh, union level wages and other benefits for projects. If you developer agrees to that, then all of a sudden the CEQA lawsuit goes away, right? Um, so that's um, uh, uh, how CEQA works. What, how some cities try to get around that is they will say, uh, uh, say a particular downtown area, they'll say, okay, we're gonna do a master CEQA review over this entire neighborhood. And then once that review is done, if you come in with a, a project that's compliant under zoning for that, then you don't have to worry about CEQA, we already did it, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So that's another thing that these sort of pro-housing cities, why the state has designated them as such, uh, because they've done things like that. Um, okay, so um, let's sum up here. Next slide, yeah. Okay, so I think it's clear, what I think is things that are very clear, we are way behind on building overall, number one. We're also way behind on the amount of money that we need to subsidize housing for lowest income and homeless individuals. I think both of those statements should be, given what we know, you know, relatively uncontroversial, okay? Also, I think that the bureaucratic problems that I've referenced as it relates to how like affordable housing finance works and other things like that, are in some ways just as big and thorny as the first two. You know, I haven't talked a tremendous amount about homelessness, but a few years back I interviewed the former mayor of Houston, uh, which has done a remarkable job at reducing uh, the homeless, homeless population there. And she told me a huge reason for that was her efforts at ensuring that all homeless housing providers in Houston, the county, the city, mental health professionals, addiction centers, they all use the same computer system, wow. right? Same language in terms of how they would refer to certain issues. And that centralized system allows peop allow people to be housed more affordably and efficiently. And you don't really see a lot of similar examples of this kind of success in California, despite there being a tremendous amount of intellectual firepower and sophistication in the homeless space. These sorts of systems that work across purposes make it very, very hard to get the kind of solutions that I think um, everyone is rightfully demanding that we have. And uh, similarly, I pointed at the big bureaucratic red tape when it comes to financing affordable housing. You cannot get the scale of units that we need because uh, within the system that we have, because every dollar is stretched thinner by our own processes, right? So where can we take some solace here? And then I'm gonna open up uh, to questions. Um, th some things, like as, we've, as I've said throughout, policy can matter and does matter. You know, the ADU reforms worked. We're having a lot more construction of uh, ADUs than we did before these reforms came in. Similarly, in New York, as I said, you know, they have a system um, that uh, makes sure that most of its homeless, po homeless population is not unsheltered, they're sheltered. Um, but I think there's also a lot more attention, I think, on these problem and solutions than before. You know, when I was first starting reporting on this in 2016 at the state level, basically the only question that those interested in housing were asking was, can we get some more money? You know, there was a lot of, uh, and I like to go too far into this, but there was um, a program called Redevelopment that went away during the state's budget crises in 2009, 2010, in, uh, uh, in there, and that provided a lot of affordable housing money. That program went away, and um, you know, there's basically the energy in 2014, 15, 16 was pretty much about can we get more money again, right? And ever since, I think now there's a lot more focus on just beyond money. What can the state do on policy levers to try to you know speed production of uh, of, uh, of housing? So I think though, at the end of the day, there's going to have to be a lot more eggs that are cracked, whether it is um, on policies that you know, allow for more development, um, on you know, tax increases, or changing in how we spend the tax monies that we have. You know, there was a proposal that's died numerous times in the legislature to end the mortgage interest reduction, the state's mortgage reduction, for second homes, right? So not even primary homes, just for second homes. 
and redirect that money towards um, homeless housing. That has not even gotten out of the first committee, right? And so in some ways, it's not we need more money. It could be we redirect, redirect the money that, that we have to those who may be um, more needy. So um, I will wrap with that, and I'm very happy to uh, answer as many questions as everybody has. John, the back. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I just want to ask. Thank you. All I would say is that um, if you have a question, I will come by with a mic so we can pick it up on the video. And uh, who has the first question? I see you. Ian has his hand up. Thank you. That was a very illuminating, good, succinct summary of a tremendous problem. Uh, are you aware of any examples in the state of California that have successfully brought a second home tax for a vacation home tax? I mean, I'm not talking about yeah. somebody who owns a house that's being rented out to a tenants who are full-time residents, but I'm talking about people who have houses that are used as vacation homes. Yeah. I, I am... Um I am aware of, uh, in terms of that realm, I am aware of some proposals, I believe in Oakland, that has already passed where there's a vacancy tax, so a tax on vacant homes. Um, I'm not aware, and the, the purpose of that is to sort of try to e either provide some cash for uh, low-income housing or to get those homes not vacant anymore, right, to have people fill them. And so, um, uh, but I am not aware offhand of a tax specifically on second homes. I do know that sort of any tax increases in general in California are many are very Byzantine in terms of how they can be promoted, particularly at the local level. And um, property tax increases in, in particular are especially hard to increase because of Prop 13. Um, so a lot of states have a lot more flexibility when it comes to taxing land and taxing property than California does. Yeah, I agree. That was a lovely presentation. Um, and my question, it, it's not a challenge. It's a, it's a kindly supportive yeah. uh, effort here on my part. Um, I've been aware for a long time that um, solutions to homelessness in general and housing have been on the books for a long, long time. And it's a matter of political will, really. And so my question for you is if you were in charge, for instance, you say there's five main sort of uh, push and pull pieces if, if you were the, in charge and everyone would do what you suggested that they do. Yeah. Uh, pretend like you're the governor. Uh, um, how would you teach back to your constituency and prioritize everything that you've been uh, talking about this evening? Right. That's a really good question because it gets at the political sort of realities of uh, this entire thing, right? No one wants... Um, homeless people on the streets. So homeless people don't want to be on the streets. People don't want to see homeless people on the streets. But there's a, a sort of um, uh, uh, sort of old saw that I've heard a few times that the only thing people hate more than homelessness is solutions to homelessness, right? Um, so it's it's hard. I mean, that's a great question. You know, um, homeowners vote more than rent, rent renters. I mean, it's just you know when you when you bring things at a at a local level, you, you know, there's there, there's also a, a belief that. And maybe I'll try to answer your question this way. Um, if you sort of, oftentimes there will be, um, if you're talking about one particular project that's in a neighborhood, you will have people in that neighborhood pretty amped up about it, or, and particularly those who don't like the project. If I'm a neighbor to something and I think it's good, am I more likely to go to the city council to like say, hey, yeah, like approve that? Or if I'm a neighbor to it, and I don't like what I think it's going to bring, I'm much more likely to go and say no. And then that creates sort of belief that the entire community is against a particular project. And so I think, you know, one way to think about this is how are we measuring community input? You know, is it the amount of folks who, who um, show up at a city council? I'll give, I'll give one more. I know I'm going on here, but I'll give one more um, thing that was really illuminating to me when I was covering local government in San Diego. It was about um, something related to fire service. And I was, it was the meeting with the city council committee hearing at two o'clock on a Tuesday. And I was watching who was talking. And the only people who were talking 
where people who could afford to take off work at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday had their own resources or were wealthy enough where they could hire someone to go on their behalf at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday, right? And if that's the entirety of who we're listening to in this process, then you're only going to get a certain demographic expressed in their point of view. And so I think if we rethink in many ways how we measure community opinion, how we measure community um, uh, input, then I think by, almost by definition, we will be seeing different preferences being put forward. And so if I had a very high level sort of solution, then it, and that would be very hard to do, but I would try to think in those terms. Uh, you spoke about ADUs, yes. and, and I'm curious because it seems that typically, historically, in California, uh, zoning has been done in a, in a, uh, by local decision, right. and that was a stroke of the pen by Sacramento that essentially doubled the density of housing in California. Have you heard discussions amongst either politicians or, or the public that uh, speaks to that and, and the idea that rather than do that, wouldn't you rezone or, or zone future projects and allow them to happen at a density you would like rather than essentially changing the property value potentially for people sure. who've already purchased uh, sure. in single family residential areas? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, speaking of politically in this, it was very interesting, I'll answer your question this way, very interesting to watch how those laws, because that was my first year covering housing and watch how those laws passed as compared to debates over similar laws that say loosen some zoning restrictions or um, eliminate some zoning restrictions. The author of that, um, the author of that proposal, um, uh, well, there were a few, very specifically said, we're going to change the definition in state code. It used to say additional dwelling unit. They changed it to accessory dwelling unit. Very specifically done to try to sidestep the political debate over single family zoning. Right? And so, for, for better and for worse, and I think this is correct, it is for better and for worse, some ways if you have more obscure solutions, then they don't attract the same public attention for better and for worse than others. I think the ADU is a perfect example of that. By that changing of the code, it was aimed, again, very aimed at specifically politically trying to get that through, and it did. Whereas that same year, the governor had put forward a proposal where he was going to make um, certain development uh, by right, um, certain development being able to be done without CEQA review. Um, and that proposal was um, like, also didn't get a, got one hearing in the legislature before it was crushed. And that was with the governor putting that forward, right? So a lot of political heft behind it. And you know, you sort of saw that over, um, there was a tremendous debate over uh, Senate Bill 9, which was the, the bill that ended um, single family zoning in the state. Whereas, you know, the actual effects one year on, there was a recent study by UC Berkeley's Turner Center barely being used anywhere in the state compared to ADUs, which in many ways practically does the exact same thing, right? And so the politics surrounding all of this in many ways is just as important as what the actual policy ends up being for better or for worse. I wondered if... Um there was, wasn't there a law that said that um, shopping centers that weren't being used could be bought up for housing? Yeah. What's happening with that? So I believe you're referring to a law that passed last year, AB 2011. Uh, that law does not go into effect until July. Uh, so, but that is something that um, folks, some folks are excited about potentially, um, you know, particularly as um, uh, you know, there's been a lot more uh, remote work now using, and you know, malls have, were already dying and now perhaps dying faster, a lot more energy and thought about potentially those conversions. I can tell you though, one thing that, that has given some folks pause, or a few things given some folks pause, but one thing is, you know, if you try to live in, I mean, you know, if you think about an office building, like they don't, the windows aren't right for like what a house would be, like there's the, you know what I mean? Like the actual conversion in some ways from what some developers have told me may be as expensive as say building ground up. Right? So in some cases it may work, it certainly might depend on the property, uh, but in other cases it's probably a bit of a no-go. Thanks, Eric. 
Wonderful presentation. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Um, I had a, I was very struck by the million dollar number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've seen that before, maybe from that article you right, wrote. Right. Um, I want to, when I'm visualizing that, that's a thousand dollars a square foot for a thousand square foot unit. Or okay, yeah. for a 500 square foot smaller unit, like a one bedroom, that's $2,000 a square foot. That is the same basic cost of a Frank Gehry Museum <laughs> per square foot. Sure, sure. When, when I was uh, in architecture school and shortly thereafter, when I was working as a housing director for one of the boroughs of New York City, mm -hmm. um, homeless housing director, I we were always challenging ourselves to, and this, I think students still do this, yeah. what can I build for $100 a square foot? Right, right, right. It's still kind of those, inex it's an inaccessible goal that folks are always aiming for, architects right. and students of architecture. Right. Now I think that number might be around $200 a square foot. Think about that, that's a $200,000 unit. So my question to you, Liam, yeah. is where are people doing this for two hundred thousand dollars or right. two hundred dollars a square foot versus a thousand or two thousand dollars a square foot, is there any example that you're aware of from your right. research around that, that we could look to yeah. around the nation? So, uh, a very good question. Uh, just to be clear on the on the costs to build, that's all in costs in the sense that it's the entire project. Often includes land, often includes the parking garage, as I mentioned. But those parking garages are driven by the requirement, so it's not just literally the unit. Right, right. right. Um, as it re I think there are other, um, in terms of your other examples, uh, two things come to mind. There are certainly other states that have, well, every other state has lower cost per unit than California does. But the, as I said, the thing that I think is most indefensible to California's process is the way in which we hand out the money. You know, Minnesota um, has a process where they have a, the state agency, and this may not be replicable in a big, much bigger state like California, does its own pro forma for what they think a development should cost in a certain area, right? And projects that can meet that pro forma score higher, in addition to them having one application rather than a million, right, stuff like that. So that's sort of one idea that attempts to address the cost, the cost issue. Um, I think also, you know, there was an example, and I think, again, this goes to show how much policy matters. Uh, again, I keep referring to Berkeley's Turner Center because I think they do good work. Uh, they did a case study a few years back of a project in San Francisco uh, 832 Bryant, I want to say. Um, I'm going to get the numbers not right, exactly right. But this, the costs to build that were significantly less than what construction costs were for other projects in San Francisco. And they did a few things. Um, they had uh, modular construction. They had um, some prefab stuff, right? Um, they had, um, oh, they were able to get other funders beyond just the state to front them loans so that they were able to engage in the financing process without having to wait for each next step. So they were able then to get the process done much quicker and at a lower cost because they had their holding costs ended up being lower. But I think it's also really important, the people behind that project were some of the most connected people in San Francisco. This was the you know, former mayor's office of housing head was in, now in charge of this developer that was doing this. So, so the political connections that were involved in making that happen were real. And I think, you know, that goes to show, though, that it is possible to be done. There's no law of nature that says it can't. It's just that, you know, we have to make it so that not just the most connected people can have those, uh, have those benefits. Thank you. Um, before I get to my question, just an anecdote following up on that. I have a friend who consults for one of the Bay Area chapters of Habitat for Humanity. And they have a project in Marin, yeah. I think, that's up upwards of $90 million. Um, that it's on the verge of collapse because it's $1,000 a foot for Habitat yeah. housing, yeah. Yeah. which relies, in theory, somewhat on volunteer labor. Although I think when you're doing 90 units, that we're, now we're talking about um, large multifamily high-rise sure. or mid-rise buildings. But still, if, Habitat is in the same boat as anybody else. So, um, I'm curious with your um, breadth of experience across the straight, across the state in different jurisdictions, and here we are in, in Monterey, um, the differences that you see and perhaps the differences that you might um, suggest between an urban environment, Los sure. Angeles, San Francisco, the Bay sure. Area, sure. And, a, and, a, and a more rural community um, like this, 
like we're in here, yeah. um, how we solve this problem. Because I think right. that in a sense, it is some different things. Sure. I mean, I know that I've, I think back 10 or 15 years, I'm an architect, yeah. and I think back 10 or 15 years designing a house, rural house in Sonoma, and I think there was a, almost $100,000 of impact fees. Mm -hmm. And it just made me, it was so obvious that at that point in time that housing policy is limited growth. It was limiting growth. It's like if we're going to charge someone $100,000 to build their vacation right. house right. Or, their, or their retirement yeah. house, it limits growth. Yeah. Um, so now we're just seeing it in a much more amplified zone. So I'm just curious this difference between, I kind of have a foot in my door in San Francisco and here, so I'm very yeah. curious what you see as these differences. Yeah, I mean, look, there are, you know, um, I think it, it certainly is clear that, um, you know, 15-story uh, high rises don't necessarily need to go everywhere, right, uh, in the state. And there are different communities and different communities have different needs and different wants and all those sorts of things. I will say, though, somewhat to, not to be a little bit cheeky about that, that, that question, but basically every community that I talk to or I read about always thinks that they're, like, they're unique and special, right? Um, you know, I, I, um, not to slag on this community called Temple City in, in, in L.A., but, you know, they were talking about an, an, an ordinance to try to uh, uh, change, you know, uh, what was allowable under SB9 and the duplex law. And they said, well, no one understands how you, what a unique jewel Temple City is. And, like, you know, sure, okay? But every community thinks they're a unique jewel, right? And so there's not enough housing anywhere. Right? And so that, I think, you know, I was driving around here, and obviously I know there are some restrictions, Central Coast, you know, most places there actually is enough water, right? But I know there are some communities here where there is not, right? Same in some places in the Central Valley. Um, so, you know, that's a thing. Um, but I was wondering, you know, I mean, is, there, is, it, is it horrible to go a second story? Like, is that horrible? And so, so uh, you know, um, that, that's just one thought as I was driving around, where that's not a huge change in the landscape, but you potentially could get this decent number more housing if you hear if you thought, thought about that. Yeah. Is there anything that's been developing about tiny houses on wheels and their, uh, their ability because they're going to be manufacturing, they're licensed by DMV. Sure. Uh, and that really brings the cost of the product down. And the, on the market, they're kind of like from the very smallest to around 60 square feet up to a maximum of 400 square sure. feet. And they're modular now they can be. Because what I'm doing is that it's one thing to get them out of a tent and into some warmth. Yeah. The other thing it is to get them in a village where they got some protection. You can keep booze and drugs out of the community. And the idea is to have manufacturing at sure. the village. Sure. So you're not only approaching the ones that need it the most, that's the homeless, giving them a job, yeah. giving them a place to rent, mm -hmm. giving them a place to get on their feet sure. and grow one module at a time until mm -hmm. they're up to the 400 square feet. Sure. Until we get affordable housing that you can own and you take your house to a senior who can't sure. afford an ADU sure. and he can get an income out of it somebody else's house that's on his property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's been done and... So, th yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there are some, um, I hear these sorts of things, you know, a lot. I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer a few ways. You know, um, mobile home parks are uh, declining. I mean, they are um, this kind of housing that you're, in some ways that you're referencing. Um, they're declining in, in some ways because they're prime development opportunities and people want to use that, right, or, or higher end uh, housing wants to use that, that land. Um, so this sort of things exist. As it relates to some of the tiny home stuff, one thing that I've heard is, is a potential barrier for that is a lot of them need additional funding for sewage connections and water connections, things like that, that make it kind of hard to achieve some of the cost savings that may be there otherwise. And so um, I know that LA has talked about, you know, and they, they have some uh, tiny homes on parking lots and things like that. Um, so there, there sort of is in effect to a certain extent, but there are some challenges that when they sort of put into practice that uh, do tend to crop up sometimes. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to address, um, kind of go back to um, the issue that you said about uh, water. Yeah. Um, so here in Monterey Peninsula, we do have a water moratorium, and it's really um, inhibited a, a lot of growth. Like, right. I feel like we're really behind um, in this region. Yeah. Um, 
is there, so like a, a homeowner can't even build an ADU and whether they, that's ADUs rented or they use it sure, as their sure, studio. Sure, okay. sure. But is there anything um, you see that might be coming down in the state that would kind of override that water moratorium and other regulations that prevent development? I think short answer is no, um, but I do think that the larger answer is there's a lot of, continues to be a lot of interest at the state level in this kind of whack-a-mole, if you will, like, you know, the state will say, well, you have to do an AD, you have to allow ADUs, and then, and you can't do, um, you know, large sewage fees or sewage hookup fees, and then the city will, and that will sort of work, potentially, and then the city will find another way to block, and so then there tends to be th that mole whacked, right? Um, and so I think, you know, Frankly, there's a lot of deference in the legislature towards what the, the elected officials from that region say. And I would be surprised, frankly, unless and until um, a critical mass of elected officials from this area say, we don't need the water moratorium, um, th which I, seems unlikely, um, that, that that would be something that would change. It's a state moratorium. It's a state moratorium, state yeah. yeah. Yeah, but unless the legislators from here were to say, we don't like that, I don't think there's any prospect of that changing. question on the ADU. Yeah. Uh, I mean, impressive numbers. I'm wondering, do we have data that actually suggests that that really results in housing? Because I have my suspicion on the Monterey Peninsula yes. that people built ADUs right. to increase the property values yeah. and have a nice little vacation add-on, sure. not necessarily adding to the housing available. So I just yeah, no, I think that's a good question. There's uh, concerns about ADUs being used for um, short-term rentals, right? Um, you know, uh, people using offices, right? That sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, but is it necessarily bad if someone builds one so that their in-laws can move in and help take care of kids, right? I, that doesn't necessarily create new housing for new people, but I don't think people would argue that that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but to your point, no, I don't think that there are really good numbers yet, and I think that there should be in terms of overall increase to the housing stock or affordable housing stock that ADUs bring, and I think that that's an area that, that should be examined further. I was going to ask a similar question about ADUs because it seems in our town they're just being used as extra square footage uh -huh. because we have square footage uh, re uh, requirements. Uh -huh. uh, and because the state did not make them required to be rentals. Yeah. So um, maybe that will catch up someday. But we're also getting pushback from some of our constituents that want to join this lawsuit that they think is going to go on the ballot to challenge okay. yeah. the HCD numbers for RENA, that they don't know how they tripled right. in this short period of time, right. and there was an audit, supposedly, and they found discrepancies. And do you see any momentum behind this uh, lawsuit? Um, what I see is you better do your plan anyway, yeah. and then if the lawsuit comes through, then it'll change things a little. Yeah. But uh, if you don't do that plan, you really stand to get some hammers lowered on your ability to um, be in charge of what gets built in your town. So right. I would so, like some comments on that. Sure. Um, so uh, maybe talking about different things. That I know that there have been lawsuits from individual communities and groups of communities, particularly in Southern California, against the state and in terms of the allocation requirements. Those, to my knowledge, not one of them have been successful. So there were lawsuits um, uh, from communities in Southern California that I don't believe has, none of them I believe have been successful. As it relates to, I think, another aspect of what you're talking about, which is a potential state initiative yeah. for 2024, um, I, I we'll see. I mean, the way that, so this is an initiative that would essentially enshrine the state constitution um, local control over zoning and, and, and housing, and, and erase many, many um, of the, particularly of the recent uh, state laws that have passed that aim to sort of abrogate that in some way. Um, frankly, though, the way that initiatives get qualified in California is if you have a lot of money. And I don't know that th these folks didn't have a lot of money, um, and they were aiming for the 2022 ballot, and they had to pull it because they weren't going to get sufficient signatures. Um, I don't know what money they have right now. Um, you know, if you're a big oil company, um, 
they recently got a, re got a referendum on the ballot for, in terms of a, a, a trying to roll back a state law that passed that um, uh, bans oil drilling within certain areas. And so they very, very quickly had the money to hire signature gatherers and get something on the ballot, and you'll be voting on that in 2024. Um, but as far as these folks, there's no, to my knowledge, not yet, there may be, but no significant benefactor that has come in to, with sufficient dollars to get something qualified. And I think if there is one, what they would also have to grapple with in terms of once it's on the ballot is there will certainly be a lot of money trying to defeat that measure were it to get on the ballot, too, from developers, from unions, from a lot of folks who benefit from there being more building, right? Um, and so uh, I think they, that's not to say that um, it's not possible, but I think they have a long road in terms of the political and financial dynamics to get something like that. Thank you. I, the, as, you're, as we're getting into the political possibility here, yeah. I had a question, an observation also, is just to get your take on how much appetite do you think there is in Sacramento for doing more um, in terms of addressing the housing crisis? Um, you know, I, I have to just observe, you know, like the League of Cities, yeah. for example, there's almost 500 cities in right. the state of California. And it's run kind of like the Electoral College or the U.S. Senate, which is, you know, the smaller cities, there's more of them than the mm. big cities, mm -hmm. and they tend to be uh, less uh, supportive of housing and densification. And so the League of Cities, from which most state legislators were probably a locally sure. elected official at sure. one time, so mm -hmm. they have some allegiance to local planning discretion. Yeah. Um, so it really it makes it hard to get the state legislature to try and impose some statewide goals. So I wonder if you just had any comments. We have a new legislature right. that just was sworn in, and do you think there's uh, more appetite, or do you think they're going to let the changes that they've made in the last few years sit and see how those are going to work, or do yeah. you have any insight on that? Yeah. So uh, with the caveat that I'm less plugged in than I used to be on this particular uh, stuff because I don't work out of the state capitol anymore, right? And I've, I've been trying to, to write more from kind of neighborhood perspective. Um, and, I, and as you're correct, there was a tremendous turnover in the state legislature, so I don't remember the exact number, but a large percentage of legislators are new this session compared to more recent previous sessions. Um, I think in terms of the tea leaves from what I'm hearing from the governor's office in particular is they seem to be very, very focused on we have these housing goals, and it is our job to like enforce these housing goals. And that's where they seems to me they want to be putting their time and energy more than anything else. They talk a lot about oh, accountability. We have plenty of laws in the books. We just need to hold people accountable for them. And so I think in terms of this, the, the, um, the governor, I think that generally tends to be where his head is. Not necessarily saying no to certain ideas, but not necessarily coming up with them himself. I think there's, you know, it was funny, um, I would watch, as I was in Sacramento, um, year after year after year, every legislator all of a sudden wanted to have a housing bill because that's what their constituents were demanding, right? And a lot of them were extremely picky unit and small, but they needed to be able to say they had a housing bill, right? Um, and so I would not be surprised if there was, given the extent of the, the crisis. And you look at polls, they're, they're nuts. I mean, the polls are nuts. There was a PPIC, which is a, a, a um, think tank, um, does great statewide polling. Uh, I believe the number came out a week or two ago, 87% of a registered voter, or no, uh, adult Californians, uh, believed that, um, feared that, or were concerned, I think was the exact language, that uh, younger generations would not be able to afford to buy a house in California. 87%, I mean, it's a gigantic number, right? And so huge concern at, um, at you know, among the public on these issues, and I think you're going to continue to see people try to respond to them in, in some way. So, Liam, thank you for your presentations. Excellent. I have really two-part questions. So the, the first is I'm curious, considering how cumbersome the California Building Code has become and how all these individual departments within the municipalities want to put their Sure. their hands out during the construction process. 
Is there anyone that you've seen that's doing it right, any city or, or county or region? Yeah. So, um, and I that's think, to control the costs. Yeah. So I think the, it's worth, and I have not done a deep dive in some of these, I mentioned these pro-housing designated cities that the state recently did, but one of the things that were called out um, uh, that the state said was a good thing uh, was that they would have these sort of, um, uh, you know, meetings, one city, I don't remember which one it is, so the cities that were named were Sacramento, Citrus Heights, Fontana, Oakland, Roseville, San Diego, Sacramento County, Placer County, El Cerrito, and West Sacramento. So one of these um, has a um, policy now, they changed their policy such that every single permitting agency, whether it's like, whether it's water, or whether it's development services, or whether it's planning or whatever, they all, they all meet, they all have like a working group so they meet over particular large projects in, in particular, to like do the whole thing at once. You know, one thing I hear a lot about in LA is, man, we got our DWP, Department of Water Power Permit, but then the um, plan department can't sign off on our, you know, our building services can't sign off until two months from now. And so we got through this hurdle, but the next hurdle that came up is another delay, right? And that, in terms of that coordination, I think is, a, again, as I've noted, is a real problem. And there are some communities that the state has called out to say, yes, you know, you're doing a better job of that. Thank you. And so that's the cost side. The other side is the, the finance side. That, yeah. that homeowner, there's just no, and particularly since 2008 and 9, to try and borrow money, particularly for younger people, is just next to impossible. So do you see anything on the horizon that might help that, help address that problem? So let me answer that, that question this way. Um, it's been really interesting to watch the state and how the state's become more sophisticated on all of these issues uh, over the last five or so years. The federal government, though, is just, I mean, they, it just, housing has always been sort of considered a, a kind of a, very much a local affair, particularly in the eyes of the federal government. And there's just, there's no energy, there's no understanding, there's no change that I've seen in the, you know, how salient housing as an issue is at the federal government. I think we're talking about things like financing. I think really that's where those solutions have to come is at the federal level. And I just haven't seen a, a tremendous amount of new ideas or new activity or you know, anything about how housing would be more pressing and concern at the federal level. You know, there was a lot of uh, money initially proposed for low-income housing in, I think, the second I don't forget what it's, this is the Inflation Reduction Act, Build Back Better, whatever, whatever which one it was, right? And when they made the final deal, all that money was cut out, right? And so housing is, doesn't rate at the, federal, at the federal level and has not rated for a very long time. And I think unless and until that changes, then sort of more complex questions about financing just aren't going to be really resolved. Maybe I'm... Uh, there are, there certainly are, but what I'm talking about is, in, is if you want to get to scale, right, then you're really going to need the federal government to be able to do that at, at, at a higher level. Yeah. Is SB 35 helping in any way to push some projects forward now? So SB 35 uh, context is a law that was passed in 2017 that essentially uh, wipes away seek review for certain projects if they meet um, uh, affordability and labor standards, right? Um, and so uh, only in cities where uh, they are behind, cities that are behind on their meeting their housing production goals for this arena process that I mentioned. Um, so uh, there's actually a new law that aims to track SB 35 projects, um, but we don't know uh, at, a, at a global scale. I, I do think at a, you know, there are individual examples where this is being used. I actually made a request recently uh, to see the SB35 projects in LA. Um, and there were about two dozen that had tried to use it. And so, again, not a, not a, particularly for a city like LA, like not a huge number of units. But I would certainly think on the margins that it may be making a difference. But again, you know, we, you see the scale of the production. The production is not meeting, you know, nothing the state has done maybe save the ADU laws, are really making a meaningful difference in, in, uh, in production writ large. Well, the city 
They are not, but that doesn't necessarily mean that SB35 is making an appreciable difference in terms of whether someone wants to build there or not. Is there an enforcement mechanism if s jurisdictions don't hit their goal? So a variety of them. Actually, SB35, which I was just mentioning, is considered sort of one of them in the sense that if there's not enough housing production according to your goal, then you are subject to this law that allows, that takes away some discretionary review over projects. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the AG has this uh, uh, housing strike force, they're calling it. I don't know how a strike force is different than a task force, but um, he likes to call it a strike force. Uh, that is, um, you know, doing things like going after the communities that are, say, trying to sort of, uh, sort of bald, in bald-faced terms, get around uh, housing laws. There are some penalties that, um, you know, aside from the builder's remedy that I discussed, that cities could face fines or whatever, ultimately, if they don't sufficiently plan or meet state compliant houses. But I'll tell you, those I just don't think are really real. You know, I'm actually considering this as maybe a bit of a preview. Considering doing a story uh, going forward about uh, Huntington Beach in Orange County, the governor came into office in um, 2019 and one of the first acts on housing was we're going to sue Huntington Beach because they have not had a compliant housing plan for forever and they need to have one and that's the state law says you have to. So big song and dance suing Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach ultimately settles and they get a compliant state housing plan but you know rel relatively recently but now that we're in the new cycle have to do a housing plan all over again. Not only does Huntington Beach not have a compliant housing plan now, they have passed an ordinance that says they, that state law in this respect does not apply to them, okay? <laughs> so, so, like, if the idea is we're going to name and shame communities that we don't think are doing their part, and once they're shamed, they're going to be shamed into doing their part, I think the Huntington Beach example shows that it's just, you know, whatever penalties that there may be just aren't, sort of strong enough, if you will, if you think this is a good thing, right, aren't strong enough to um, overcome uh, certain attitudes about that. But one of, yeah. one of them was the builder's solution. You mentioned it earlier. Sorry. Uh, the, say that again. Sorry. One of the mechanisms was the builder's solution. In other words, they lose control of some of the developments. Yeah. One, something's not been proposed on Huntington Beach yet, and I think there are a lot of reasons around that. Maybe the builder's remedy could work, but we haven't seen it work yet. And I think we're, you know, there's, there's potential sequel issues, as I, as I mentioned. If you're along the coast, as Huntington Beach is, there's the Coastal Act, which could govern and uh, potentially obviate the benefits that, benefits that would go to a developer for that. And so, unless and until there's a, uh, you know, a, a shovel in the ground with one of those, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit skeptical that's going to make sort of any large uh, uh, difference. Um, I should note, uh, and I should give myself a shout out here for the, the podcast, which is uh, Give Me Shelter, which is also the name of the best Rolling Stone song, um, which of course made it the name that we wanted to call our, our, our podcast. Uh, but it comes out every other week, and we actually just had an episode that published, uh, went live today, that talked about the Builder's Remedy. So if that was of interest to you, you can find more about that. Yeah. Great. So I think we're coming to the end. One last question, maybe? You know, locally, yeah. Santa Cruz County was sued for a non-compliant housing element years ago, yeah. and they did rezone a number of sites. And yeah. I built, uh, we built over 200 units on those sites that they rezoned. So I love that you're going to cover it, but yeah. there are, you know, stories out there that work. Yeah. And prior to being up here, I was in San Diego, and around the corner for me was an attorney named Catherine Rodman, who's made a whole career of suing cities yes. and trying to force them to do this stuff. So I would yes. talk to her yes. just so that you have the full scope, because those predate you know, some of the stories that sure. you're looking at. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, when I was in San Diego, I, I would actually uh, yeah. certainly talk to Catherine. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that none of this stuff like ever works, but I think that, you know, and I think, too, some of the threat, it's interesting, you know, there's been, there was this, you may have heard there was this sort of uh, kerfuffle in Atherton involving Steph Curry, um, where um, you know Atherton was putting together its housing plan because remember January 31st, all the Bay Area communities had to have their their, their plan due, and um, Steph Curry sent a, and his wife sent a letter to the city saying, please don't you know rezone the property behind me because I'm I, I don't want townhomes there, um, and and uh, so. Uh, but 
this sort of threat of the builder's remedy came up, up time and again in Atherton's discussion uh, about whether they were going to approve their housing plan or not. And so, um, you know, I think in some ways it's not just whether the lawsuit works to give, more, I guess, in some ways more credit to um, what the legislature is doing beyond just, you know, how many units will the builders will a builder's remedy project result in? It is our communities sufficiently scared of penalty X or penalty Y that they will just do it because they're afraid of this guy, you know? Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Um, thank everyone. Great participation. I really appreciate all those questions. I would just say, encourage everyone to come March 16th, our next, uh, next event with um, David Baker Architects. And I also want to give a shout out to the Pine Inn and Carmel, who supplies the housing or the hotels for our, <laughs> for our uh, speakers. And also, one final thing, if you're an AIA member and are interested in um, being on one of our committees, um, Libby Barnes here is head of the COAT Committee, which is Committee on the Environment. And she would love to have some participation, so please speak to her at the back of the room if you're interested. And thanks, everyone. There's wine and cheese, and we'll see you in March 16th. Thank you.